All right, now it's time for our guest, uh, one of the great young minds in the NFL and a very pivotal position as the general manager of the Minnesota Vikings. He's in his second off season with Minnesota. Very well respected, very well liked guy, but we are now at a crossroads for the Vikings franchise and it's really cool to have on Kwesi Adolfo Mensa. Kwesi, what's up, man? Shregs, always good to see you, man. Thanks for having me. Oh, it is so good having you on. Um, you know, this podcast is more evergreen, as I always tell my guests. It's not about current events. What I'm, my hope is that two years down the line, someone listens to this podcast and is like, I got a lot out of that interview and I got a lot of that conversation. Uh, but I would be remiss just to give you an opportunity to speak on what happened in the last 72 hours. Obviously, you guys with um, a lot of speculation going into it, you finally did release Dalvin Cook. If you just want to spend a second either on the release or just what Dalvin meant to the Minnesota Vikings, I know you guys had some statements just to kind of tie a bow on on the Dalvin Cook era in Minnesota. Yeah, you know, it's it's a part of the job. These are these are all really tough decisions. You talk about Dalvin Cook, a franchise pillar, um, incredibly productive over his time here, and I'm glad I got to see that up close uh, last year. A guy who wants the ball, wants to help his team win, um, can do it from all levels of, of, of offensive play. Just a, a talented player. Um, his teammates love him. And again, these are really hard decisions we have to make. But you know, they give us constraints in the NFL, and you're always trying to build towards that ultimate goal. And sometimes these these decisions are the ones you have to make, and they they, they get made with a lot of uh, care and thought um, because obviously you're dealing with people, but also just ring of honor type players, which uh, mm. which Dalvin Cook is. Um, and again, the, these aren't these aren't these aren't easy. Uh, no no doubt in my mind. Uh, but ultimately, we made the decision, and we wish him the best. And, and obviously, we'll always be fans of his here in Minnesota. That's cool. Yeah, you guys were really classy uh, with some of the statements we saw from ownership and from you and from Kevin. And I think you know whether or not the the, the wound is sore right now, like when time will will tell how it goes for Dalvin. But at the very least, I think you guys handled it as well as you could publicly. Um, which leads to, I think, your story, because I, I think a lot of people for years had this vision of general manager being a guy who lived in the back of a van and would scout, you know, small schools in southern Texas and then get on the car and then say, OK, in 12 hours, I got to be in eastern Nebraska and do this thing. You have a different path. And I think the I think you're often described as like a money ball guy. But I think that's short, short changing you a little bit. Um, take us through. A, your college experience, and then maybe your postgraduate experience, and then how you ended up working for the 49ers in 2013. Yeah, you know, I'm not sure I, I know how I, how this all all <laughs> happened and got here. But I, I will say that that guy in the van who goes and scouts the small school, that guy's important. That guy's Oh, yeah, he is. Um, and it's, you know, this job is really evolved over time you know we do media we do contracts we do you have to oversee an organization a really you know a, a really profitable organization so I think my skill sets have kind of aided in the new NFL the new definition of the job uh, versus kind of what it was before but you know going back to my undergraduate experience you know it was great honestly I was just a kid in, in South Jersey immigrant parents uh, you know Grew up in my, my family's from Ghana, West Africa, so super proud of that and and how that all impacted my life. But went to Princeton, uh, you know, I thought I was a cool kid and I was going to go study with a bunch of nerds. Uh, turned, I found out that I was just as nerdy as anybody else there. <laughs> and uh, you know, but I, you know, I love my time there. I was actually I went there just as a student. Uh, really loved math and and economics. That's what I studied. Happened to grow, you know, seven inches my freshman year, and uh, so I went from a, 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 a point guard who couldn't see. Over Did the you play ball guard. in high school? I so I actually got cut from the basketball team my sophomore year. Uh, really, really tragic story. I, I, if you want to talk about it over, let's go. Let's I dig will, in. All right, no, Cherry, it's, uh, what is it? Cherry Hill South. What was it called? What was the Cher school? Cherry Hill East. Cherry Hill East Cougars. Cherry Hill East. Uh, shout out okay. to all my people out back there. Love uh, yep. so much love for my time growing up. But yeah, uh, you know, I was a cerebral point guard. I had handles, but I wasn't very quick. I hadn't really grown into uh, grown into my body just yet uh, there were some better players uh, they thought were available uh, but ultimately you know you're never going to agree with those decisions everybody's been cut at some point in their life uh, and but ultimately you know I, I played golf actually in high school I, I got cut really? from the basketball team and became a, a high school golfer uh, which was great you know you talk about a, a sport that teaches you process how do you move on from the last bad shot to the next good shot uh, really and that that connected me to my, my Wall Street job because really when you make decisions it's all about process how do you get over that trade that you lost money on how do you move on to the next one and process <laughs> like and a cornerback like yeah it's no doubt no doubt and so that's really what, what, what led me to you know studying at Princeton and, and, and majoring economics 
and, and all that good stuff, uh, really got interested in behavioral economics and how decision making and, and human emotion really are, interact together, uh, which took me to Wall Street where I interned on a commodities desk uh, trading gold and silver the summer after my junior year, got to live in New York uh, down in Water Street and yeah. do, do that experience as you know, as we, we talk about New York all the time, my, my favorite place um, on earth. Uh, but, you know, that, that took me there and then obviously had that career, went to Stanford where I wanted to become an econ professor. Uh, you know, I have a passion for teaching. I think, you know, the way I learn is very simple. I, I try and every step try and learn at, at its core, its foundation, which makes me able to teach it back to other people. I think a lot of times teachers are people who understand things at high levels can't teach because the simple things are just so you know so easy for them that they mm -hmm. really don't whereas me i'll go over every single step and and that's really my, my my gift as a teacher and i wanted to teach economics so i went back uh learned and studied uh, you know i wasn't i don't know that i was gonna change economics uh and so i you know there was a little bit of a competitor still left in me i still wanted to apply and and practice my my my, my knowledge in industry was really interested in sports and you know wanted to seek out an opportunity. Obviously the 49ers, it was fortunate. They were happened to be looking for somebody to advance their efforts. Uh, Brian Hampton and Parag Marate, I got connected with them at the MIT Sports Analytics Conference. And cool. the rest is what, as what they say is history. So wait, so you go to Sloan uh, in what, like 2012, 2013? Cool. 2012, 2012. 2012, yeah. and you're just a Stanford graduate student who has a Wall Street career and you're like, look, I'm doing this, but I wanna get into sports. I'm willing to sacrifice everything to Give it a shot. I'm assuming your entry level pay was not what it was on Wall Street. No, 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 no. I tell you know. I, so I showed up to that conference wearing my white Stanford polo. Yeah. Uh, you know, not knowing anything. And what was cool about that conference is you just got to meet a lot of great people. I mean, I got to. I remember go, got to go up to Kiki Vandeweghe. People yeah. that I had like learned. And RC Buford was there. Just a lot of talented people were in one place. And I wasn't there really looking for a job. I was just there to like kind of learn about sports. I had a. I actually had a great conversation with Jacoby. Uh, this is early, you know, Jacoby and Jalen those days. Yeah, and, Dave Jacoby, you know, sure. Yeah, yeah. And so, uh, and then obviously I met with the 49ers and they said, hey, let's talk when we get back. And and that's what we did. Uh, and obviously, you know, things worked out for for us in the end. You mentioned you grew seven inches in college, so you come in there not as an athlete, but as a student. So you get into Princeton, and then you grow seven inches. I have to think, you know, someone on campus is like, "Have you considered ball?" Like, I, I, if you played no. at least at any level, you, you'd be surprised. You walk around Princeton. Every there's a lot of six three guys walking around. There's a, it's a really <laughs> ath yeah, a lot a lot of people play sports there, whether it be water polo, volleyball, whatever it is. And uh, I was friends with all those those people, but yeah, there's a lot of athletic people walking around that campus, so they weren't necessarily looking for me. But I, you know, I showed up to practice that first day. My little Kobe half row, uh, yeah. you know, I was the Jadwin Jim. Where yeah, are we at? Yeah, Jadwin Jim. You know, I I put put my summer in. Yeah. Uh, you know, all, all those two day workouts with my friends, and you know, obviously, I, I I was good enough to you know play on the JV team and and have do do, do some practicing um, and all that good stuff. And you know, it was, again, super cool because the 15 year old of me that never left, you know, that never got off that floor, got cut, you know, got to see that dream fulfilled in in, yeah. in, a, in a small way, and that's something I always take with me. That's awesome. Um, mentors. I feel like if you go to Princeton or you go to Stanford, you've got the leaders in thought and you've got the leaders in, in you know, leadership, especially let's go to Stanford. When I talk about Stanford football to a lot of people, it's, it's often not, hey, I learned this from Harbaugh or David Shaw. It's, I was also connected to this guy in Silicon Valley who, by the way, happens to run a venture capitalism firm and also is a mentor to X, Y, and Z. Like, when you get to those institutions of that academic prowess with those alumni bases, did you know at the time, like, I got to make the most out of this and make connections? Or is it one of those things that if you just go there, it's hard to avoid getting connected to the right people? You know, it's, it's one of those things that I probably, and I don't really live a life with regrets. If I could have pushed myself a little bit, would have been more if I could tell any kid to come after me seek out those relationships. I kind of let them happen by chance. Mm -hmm. I happen to take a class with Daniel Kahneman. I happen to take a class with Burton Malkia, who's become a, a, a great mentor of mine when I was at Princeton and then at Stanford. Um, I was lucky enough to take classes with, you know, a hasty, and he's, he's a really, he's a big titan in the analytics world and, and different people like that. Um, it's so fortunate, but I don't know that I sought it out as much as I should have. And if I could go back again, you know, I, I Matt Angelou was at Princeton when I was there. Is that right? You know what I mean? Like, you know, and I, I, I that's you know, I wish I had maybe gotten coffee with her or whatever, something like that. So for, to everybody who comes after me, please make sure you seek out those relationships when you have access to them. Yeah. Um, okay. So you get to the Niners, you're back in the Bay uh, after some time in New York. How did you apply your Wall Street skills and what you did and then try to integrate that into what 
at the time, I know the Niners are always forward thinking, but also at the time, like football is kind of meat and potatoes as well. Yeah, that, that was probably the, the biggest challenge. You know, I got there after they had won uh, three NFC championships in a row, been to a Super Bowl. I got there right after they had lost the Super Bowl. So I, I, I'm not going there thinking I'm helping them. Yeah. Right. I mean, they, they, they seem to have it pretty figured out uh, by them. So I really took it as just I'm going to I'm here to learn. I'm going to show them my thought process and how that works. And really, I, I think a lot of times in the analytics world, people are you know, it's almost like a project where you're studying things. And that's good. You want to study things, but you also got to make decisions and decisions have ramifications. They have good things that happen, bad things that happen. You have to be able to quantify them and really understand them before you make a decision. Uh, so that was, I would say, my best value add was really coming from a practical decision-making standpoint and saying, hey, I know this is what the model and the analysis says, but I've, I've done that. I've lost a million dollars in 10 minutes. Mm -hmm. I know how that feels. I know how this feels. I know the, the, the emotional side of it uh, and, and really having to understand to get a whole building together behind your uh, thought process. That's different than just computing something into a code and outputting something that's very different. And so I think that was the thing they appreciated, out of me, appreciated about me the most. And then second, I didn't know anything. You know, I'm here because I didn't know anything. Humility. Humility, right? I just, well, it was easy because I actually didn't know anything, right? So I could go into an office and ask, hey, hey, CFO, tell me about the run game. Tell me everything you need to know because I'm not insecure about that because I don't think I... I'm supposed to know, and he, and he doesn't mind teaching me because I've helped him with some other thing. And so just so many relationships I've built, and I was just talking to our scouting associates who just got here to start, and I was like, just be just be curious. If you can do one thing, okay. be curious. Just, just ask questions, because I'm telling you, I've sat in rooms with people who have been in the NFL for 20 years who never asked that question. And I'm like, well, I, I know that, and I've only been in the league ten years because I because I wasn't scared to ask, and I don't I don't I don't think there are dumb questions. So that was really my the best thing that helped me get here. What was your life like in New York City when you were at Wall Street? You said you interned and then you took a job, so you don't have to name the companies or you can. But I see just on the website it says day trader, like that could be a million things. So yeah. take us through your day to day as a young twenty three year old Quasi. Because like, I'll tell you what, you and I have <laughs> talked about it. I did my 20s in New York, different deal. I wasn't a Wall Street guy. I was more of a struggling uh, sports writer living with five guys in a loft. But I think we had similar paths, I'm sure, where you work hard, you play hard. No doubt, man. We, we st I had similar paths. You know, I lived with five five, and then six guys in a loft. Uh, <laughs> six we, guys? We, six guys, man. We still, have a, we still have a text group called Hotness. Because uh, that's what we, because that's what we called our place. I love those guys to death. Those brothers where was the place? Life. Water Street? Is that where you live? No, no. Uh, that place was 30th and Madison. Okay, Murray yeah. Hill, heart of Murray, it. Heart You're of at it, Bank man. Cafe every day. Let's go. <laughs> Bank Cafe. We had a little deli, Miss K's deli downstairs. Yep. Uh, I don't know how clean it was, but we ate there a lot. Uh, no, man. I, I smile so much because that time of my life was just such a blessing. Uh, living in New York City is something that I'll always just be grateful that I got to do all the experiences. You know, you, you go out in New York City on a Friday night with your wallet and your cell phone and anything could happen. It feels anything like happened. anything could happen. Anything could happen. Uh, and it just But that, you also and, meet anyone and everyone from all different backgrounds. And we joke about it like, oh, it was crazy wild times. But gosh, uh, I'm raising my kid in New York City. Like, oh, I think it's a pretty cool cultural experience. It's it's incredible, man. It's, you know, you're, you're in your Friday night in New York is very different than your Tuesday afternoon New York, right? There's yeah. different peoples, different vibes. Uh, just, again, such a blessing. But, you know, connecting that to the work side of it. Yeah, we, we worked really hard, too. Uh, getting the trade is, is an education that I, I, I just, I'm so fortunate for. I feel like the world has become so dug in on what they think. And for me, I got to go make decisions and be wrong and be right, but also be wrong and have somebody really smart take the other side of my view and have to think about that and being like, hey, I think I'm smart, but this person's really smart and they disagree with me. Maybe I'm missing something. Maybe it, it, that that open-mindedness that I have comes from pain and loss. It comes from being on the other side of really smart people who were right sometimes and when, when I was wrong and really just not thinking I have the world figured out. And, and, and that, that just that, that blessing that I, I was able to receive in that education is something I, I've taken with me. And I try and give back to other people. I actually have a nonprofit where I try and teach. Really? You know, yeah, finance to. to What's it called? Really, uh, donut. <laughs> it's, a, you know, donut. It's a term we used to use on Wall Street, a friend of mine made up, where you don't want to. Obviously, a donut's a bad thing. So I'm trying to teach people to obviously not be a donut. And I do it with some of our players. And I think all this stuff in finance is learnable. It's really applicable to every aspect of your life. And so I'm passionate about giving back to other people. Yeah. You know, you said you went to the Sloan Con. I'm sorry if I'm fixated on this area of your life, but yeah. so many listeners of this podcast 
are on the treadmill right now, they're traveling, they're on a plane, and they're flying to another sales convention, or they're working out because they've got to get to the office by Sunday. And if I only had the opportunity to, and like, we know it's a giant leap, but you made the leap. Was there a morning where you woke up and were like, I just can't do this anymore? Or was this where you were like, I'm a single guy and this is what I want to try to do? Like, what, what was there a turning point or was it just, this is months in the making? Yeah, it was, it was a longer decision. I, I just, and I, as much as I loved Wall Street, I just didn't want, not, not to be morbid, but I always yeah. think about what, what do you want your tombstone to read? Wow. You know, how, how do you want it to read? And, and I didn't want that to be the sole thing that, that, that was on there. Not, not that it was a bad thing, but just I wanted more uh, in my life. And so, you know, I think I always wanted to pivot at some point to do something different. And obviously football just you came calling. I was really fortunate to go meet everybody at the, the Sloan Conference. Uh, but there were a lot of hard days, man. Uh, you know, I think you asked me earlier going from what I was making to, mm. to I mean, you're talking about making one I think I did the math it was like 1 20th of what is I that made, right right I yeah, mean, yeah 1 20th 1 20th right so with you, you no guarantee about, that there's a huge upside no guarantee right it's crazy my, my, my boss who wrote my recommendation uh, for Stanford you know when I got in and I was leaving he's like so you're really going like you know, I don't think I would be as a me. friend I would have been asking you the same thing dude <laughs> and you know obviously it, we're, we're all glad that it worked out here but there were a lot of days where I was like what did I do you know, there's certainly I'm not going to sit here and tell you it was this easy, you know, easy path. I, I went from, you know, money not being a, a big variable in my life to, hey, maybe, hey, what, what's that coupon? What's that? Put what's that, that back? <laughs> yeah, let me cut Ramen's back. not terrible for a Tuesday <laughs> night. Yeah. And so, you know, but I'm again, I'm so fortunate to have had that experience and and grown from it. I was I took it as a challenge. How do I how do I humble myself? How do I change my life to, to accomplish my goals? And, you know, I'm glad I, I did it. I, I said the money ball thing because I think when you got hired, that was thrown around a lot. And I kind of cringe because I'm like, he's more than that, obviously. He's had a decade of experience in the NFL. He obviously scouts players. Like, um, They go from Trent Baalke to John Lynch. There's also new leadership. How do you kind of integrate yourself into a new GM and try to sell yourself again and say, here's what yeah. I bring. Here's the value. I know Lynch is one of the greatest, but like, that's a thing also, the new boss in town. It, it, 100%. I got to give a lot of credit to JL. JL is one of the most open-minded, collaborative people I've ever met. Um, and so a lot of that was just him wanting a lot of smart people in the, off, in the room. And he's like, hey, if this guy's smart, I want to I wanna use him. And so honestly, randomly, I had met JL my second week on the job. He was doing TV, a preseason game, and yep. they had asked me to go spot. You know what spotting is? Yes. Yeah, I, 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 I didn't know what it was. And so I show so you up. You were the spotter? Like, hey, the, the third lineman, on, a spotter for the listeners at home. It's basically you're helping the broadcast crew when they don't know all the players. You're pointing out who it is and you're handing information and notes. So in a preseason game when there's 75 guys out there, you're the one who's kind of helping out the broadcaster saying, yeah. and usually these guys are volunteers, but you were doing it as an employee of the team? Right. So they, they asked me to do it. Hold on. They, they, I got to finish the story. They asked me to do it. I get there and JL and Burkhardt are there and, they're, and, I'm, and I'm honest. I'm like, hey, I have no idea what I'm doing. Yeah. And they're just, and they, they called somebody right away. JL's like, hey, man, I love you but we're going to go with somebody else. And so I, I love, so the first day on the, on the job, we kind of rehashed and laughed about that story. I love that. Uh, but uh, yeah, so I met JL and obviously I had done a lot of research to help with the hiring process and just talking about the great organizations, what they have and they have alignment and people with no ego and, and collaborative and different things like that. And JL was the living, you know, breathing embodiment of that. Um, and I had written this document for the 49ers that talked about all these things and he read it. And there was a quote on there by a family friend of his talk about life being just hmm. this is random connection and he's like hey who wrote this who you know who, and it was a trader it was a, it was a trader that i you know one of my trading you know people that i looked up to when i was in that industry so who's that about, trader i love getting the credit uh, here oh man paul tudor jones uh he's okay. one of the best best there is uh and i read about him in a book called market wizards and that was actually when i started to change my mind frame in trading and really started to understand what that business was and so to have that quote be a, a thing that me and him were able to connect on it's just you talk about life being just this fortunate circle i'm just so happy that we had that relationship all right, not to pinpoint what you did for the 49ers, but before we move on to your next stage in your career, let's just say the Niners, we know, so smart with compensatory picks, always loading up with things that you wouldn't expect, also great on day three. So I'm just going to say a name and just hypothetically tell me, like, when this May pick was made, like, your role in the process or what your input was, like, George Kittle's a fifth-round pick, and you were sure. there. Yeah. So what's Kwesi do to help contribute to a George Kittle selection? 
So that was the first year they got there, so I wasn't as involved in draft meetings okay. as I was. But I did things, I did models. So a lot of models that would take information like their on-field production or their combine and kind of give a number that says, hey, this is pretty good. This is actually better than everybody's talked about. So they had all my model grades, and our models liked him a little bit better than the consensus. But I, I said this at my opening press conference. I didn't. I didn't say George Kittle would be the you know one of the best tight ends that yeah. would play this game. I'm not going to sit here and try and take that credit. But on the margins, it did like him a little bit better than you know some other sources did. Sure. All right. So you have this great success with San Francisco. You know, all the way to a Super Bowl. Then you go to Cleveland. You join Andrew Barry in Cleveland, another Ivy League guy from a different school, of course. He's a Harvard man. Um, how do you make that jump to Cleveland, and why did you make that jump? Yeah, you know it's a that that's a blessing. You know, I met Andrew in an elevator bank at the combine. Um, Damn, decided, really? Yeah, completely random. And I had heard about him, and I, I guess in hindsight, he had maybe heard a couple things about me. But you know, we just started a relationship, had dinner. You, you got to network. You got to meet people. You never know uh, when their opportunity would come. And I had dinner with him, and in about five minutes, I was like, "Oh, this guy's going to be a GM." You know, it's if you met Andrew Barry before, you would know that. Yeah, he's brilliant, uh, brilliant, brilliant kid. Just down to earth, great human, uh, great family. Just and so. You know, that relationship started, and look, you've seen what was in that San Francisco building. There, I, there was a logjam of really talented people. Let's go through the and names, because Rand Carthon's now a Rand, GM Rand, with Tennessee. John Rand, Lynch, Parag is now going to own Leeds, I think. Um, <laughs> I think that's about happening. Uh, yeah. Yourself, who else we got? Like, who are the other names? Brian Hampton, I mean, really well regarded. Brian Hampton, Ethan Waz, now assistant GM in Jacksonville. Adam, Adam Peters. Peters. Adam Peters is a stud. So you're just talking about a lot of people. And look, I, I wanted that next step in my career. I wanted to grow. There's certain rooms and conversations I wanted to see and be a part of. And sometimes you have to leave in your career to go take that opportunity. But that doesn't mean there's not a ton of love and respect and admiration for the people I work with in San Francisco. So you go to Cleveland, and then the Minnesota GM job opens up. You interviewed for Chicago as well, I want to say yes I did. Um, how do you prep for a general manager position in those interviews and Minnesota specifically what did you hone in on and really try to get that job because it's one of the obviously crown jewel franchises in the NFL you know for a GM job it's really you have great mentors that help you so Andrew Barry was one of my my, you know, my best sources I, I, I joke with him I, I think I owed him a commission for just for getting all the preparation you know really when I first got there he said Quace you're going to be a GM one day and I wasn't even sure at that point that I should be a VP of ops you know, and he was pushing me, hey, if you're making decisions, what would you do? What would you do? And so really I had a book and a, a really a, an approach and a thought process built over two years. So I was ready when I got to those positions because of him. And then people like Charlie Casterly, who, you know, is really helpful. He reached out to me, somebody I just texted him with the other day, just kind of taught me about, you know, how things go, how different buildings, the history of the game and all different things. You really just want to get ready, get prepared with their roster. But they have to leave that in from that interview knowing who you are. Who is Quasey? What are the four things that we're going to get with Quasey? And honestly, that's just genuine. That's got to come from who you are. That, that, can't, that can't be fake. I can't try and be Andrew Barry or John Lynch. I got to be the genuine to myself. You know, I'll never forget the first banking interview I had in college. I got to the final round and I got nervous. I was like, well, I got to try and act like what I yeah. think an investment banker is going to be like. And I didn't sure. get the job. I got to get the job. It's the only interview, at least in that cycle, that I didn't get the job when I got to the final round. And I told myself, if you're going to go out, just shoot, your, just be you. And if yeah. that's not good, if that's not good enough, that's okay. But just be yourself. And, and I took that and obviously was that in, in the interview process. And look, I'm a little different. You know, I'm going to say words in, 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 a, in a football interview that other people aren't going to say. But yep. I'm going to say I'm going to be myself, be my authentic self. And, and ultimately, that took me where I wanted to go. But the Minnesota interview, what I was so impressed with their process was a lot of it was about leadership. Leadership and culture. I think a lot of times people, like you said earlier, try and make the GM job head scout. And, and that is a portion of the job, but a lot of the job is leadership, setting up process, building culture, vision, all those things. And Minnesota immediately impressed me with how they, they sought out those things. So it was just a match. And I know they tell the story of how I came skipping down the stairs from my, my office uh, to my wife. Uh, but it really was. I was so invigorated by by that because those are the things that I had prepared for. That's what I think is important in the job. Look, I'm going to hire smarter analytics people than me. I'm going to hire better scouts than me. That's the point. I've got to just know enough to be dangerous to be able to manage them, lead, and combine all the information to make decisions. And I think coming from Minnesota's interview process, I was, I was sure that that's what they were looking for. And then to your point, the ownership group, I mean, the Wolves are just, they're, they're incredible people. Great, great I think people. it's, I think it's, not to cut you off, I think it's the best facility in the NFL. I will say no that. Question. I think the NFLPA survey said a lot when you have A-plus across the board for the way people are treated. 
And the Will family, they're, they're relatively new owners. I'd say the last 20 years, obviously, they took over, and you get that new stadium thing. Like, players love playing there, too. So you've got a nice advantage in your back corner where there's, like, a lot of positive things going on before you even step into the job. No question. And no, no question. And look... These jobs are so rare, though, so it's not like I was sitting there saying, you know, let, let me hold out for the crown jewel type of Minnesota. But, you know, good fortune had it that, you know, they, they, they liked what I was putting down. And I obviously loved uh, the organization that I came to. All right. So you get there last year. You guys win 13 games. You win, I think, 11 games, like, in the, by one score. Like, I, I would have to imagine that ex- – maybe you didn't. Maybe you were like, we're going to win Super Bowl in year one. But that set the bar pretty high for year two and beyond. What was year one like with Kevin O'Connell? That that was incredible. You know, I, I can't believe we've gotten this far without talking about Ko. But uh, you know, he he's just my he's my partner in crime. And Did I you guys him. have a good relationship in San Fran? We 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 met. We we had lunches together because he's just such a great guy. And we, he's I the remember man. But I, he, he was a chip, right? It was Chip was and Ryan chip. Day and Kevin O'Connor yeah. and all these young guys. Yeah. And he, he had this weird title like special projects or something like that. So we joke. I was the R and D analyst and he was special projects. And now Crick. we're head coach and GM together. <laughs> Uh, but we had lunch together a, a few times, and I remember, again, I, like I said, I pick people's brain when I, when I get to talk to them, so I ask them about quarterback play. And so when the Wills asked me about him after my first interview, I was like, oh, you know, I haven't stayed in touch with him, but he used to tell me the smartest thing about quarterbacks. And I, and I just kind of left, not thinking anything yeah. of it, you know. And, and obviously then I, I get to the, the GM job, and I know that they, they think they're in high regard with him. And I, I watch the interview, and I start doing my reference work. And, I mean, he's, he's, a, he's a home run, A-plus a guy. And I think we can win championships together. I just got to do my part of the, the equation and, and, and handle, handle the business. But, you know, last year was incredible, you know. And obviously it set a high bar. And you don't know. You, you can't – when people say exceed expectations – in the NFL, there's just the margins are so thin, so thin, right? You know, and so I think you can generally say, hey, I think we're a playoff team, or we're a team that should be Final Four good, or or maybe bottom third good. But you don't really know specifically, as you said, 13 or 11 one score games. Four of them go differently. The record's different. I understand that. I'm not. I'm not going to sit here and tell you I don't. Uh, but you can set yourself to, up to succeed with a team that you think should be a playoff team. And we did. We thought we had a good team with the culture we were building, the veteran leadership that we had. Um, We were really – and ultimately that's what I think carried the day in those 11 one-score games, right? Sure. Veteran leadership. And this year we're taking the bet that those young players that were on the roster that saw those games – now, hey, this is the standard. This is how the Minnesota Vikings show up and, and, and show out. And so that's what we're, we're, we're thinking that will carry us this year. It's, it's an interesting second season because you have the benefit of the doubt now after year one. But there are some popular guys. I think Adam Thielen's a beloved guy. Dalvin Cook was a beloved guy. You see their jerseys in the stands, but you made tough decisions. When you make those tough decisions and then you, do you read the fan responses? Do you Are you one of those guys that doesn't read? Like, uh, I would imagine a lot of fans are not thrilled when you let go of the longtime veterans who had great seasons last year yeah. with the Vikings. I got to stop you. I don't know that you get benefit of the doubt in this business. I think it's, it's a it's a true. very urgent business. The second that season ended, I I went back to you know not make not knowing what I'm doing, and and that's mm-hmm. I, I respect that. That's that is the job. Um, I'm one of those GMs who doesn't read it. Uh, pretty private person. So one of the per, one of the hardest parts about this job for me is that you know I, I people say my name or anything like that. That's really hard for me. And so the way I kind of stay out of that is to just kind of not watch it. I tell my friends, please don't send me anything. And it's not, good or bad. It's nothing to do with that. It's just, you know, I just want to stay focused because I'm really hard on myself. I, I don't know that any commenter on Reddit or Twitter or announcer could be any harder on himself than myself. Uh, and so trust me, if, if there's stuff going wrong in this building, I'm the one who's who's driving that uh, and, and driving us trying to get better. And so, yeah, but those are hard decisions. I can't sit here and tell you I know for certain, right? Decision making under uncertainty is because you don't know. Uh, but you have to have a good process, make your bets, and, and ultimately live with the consequences. And that's what we do in this building. Really quick, a couple of quick hitters, and then we'll let you go because this has been really informative and we've gotten to know you at a different level than just transaction X, Y, Z. Here's how it was done. Um, your greatest mentor uh, of your career, who you would point to and say, this is the person I, I take leadership lessons from, would be who? Oof. Oh, man. Come on. It's like naming my top five rappers, man. I'm, <laughs> I'm going I'm to hurt somebody if I leave them out. Yeah, I got to name one. Name two or three. Let me hear the names. I love this stuff. All right. Okay. I'm going to go Andrew Barry. Obviously, okay. I think he's a superhuman. Uh, I don't. I don't. Sometimes don't know if there's anybody more qualified to do this job than him. Uh, John Lynch, just the genuineness with which he conducts business, open minded. It's like all the stuff I talk about. Just really a, a hero of mine. And then if I can give you like an off one, yeah. You know, outside of football, my mom. 
uh, my hero. You know, I think she's an incredible person. She taught me how to lead her way. Um, her way was demanding process. She always demanded that I tried hard. It was never about what happened at the end of the result. It was, hey, well, what did you put into it? Can you get better next time? Uh, her emotional, just compassion for people, and that's how I try and lead. I, I need people to know that I care about them a lot, and that's something that's big with Kevin. So I, I, I'd be remiss to not mention her as well. I love it. The unsung member of the Minnesota Vikings roster that people might not talk enough about that you guys look at and you're like, that guy's a core pillar to what we're doing. Josh Metellus. Josh Metellus. I think go he's on, a guy. Talk. Yeah, Cause I, I know, hear that name. I'm like, I don't see, I, you know, okay, yeah, go. Yeah. He's a safety and, and he'll, he'll play some more this year. So I think you'll see the stuff that we've seen uh, before that, but he was a special teams, just stalwart last year, uh, team captain type. You know, I was in the team meeting room when, uh, later in the season after somebody got hurt, he was given team captain. And you could feel when somebody's teammates really love them, really appreciate them, and really want to follow them into battle. And he's one of those guys. Uh, he's somebody, he's everything that the Minnesota Vikings are about. Um, and, and I think the, the, the fans and people are going to really appreciate that more this season. Kirk Cousins' best quality is what? I mean, he can make every throw. His arm talent, he's, in, he's accurate. He can hit every level throw. Um, the decision making is is really solid. He the game of football is you you hold that ball that beautiful ball that means everything and you got to make sure that you take care of it. You don't give it to the other team and you take chances when it's time. Uh, and obviously he would tell you could always improve, but that's one of the best things he does is make sure that he gives us a chance to win every Sunday, which he has done uh, time and time again in his career. Your top three rappers are whom? Ooh, well, I, okay, I came up in that era. Uh, okay. Notorious, notorious. Uh, yeah. That's my guy. Uh, you know, I'm an East Coast guy and, and just loved him, everything about him, his flow. See, I, I would think, I, think Philly. I would immediately go to these Philly rappers, but you're a South Jersey guy. I'm a South still, Jersey okay. guy. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you're talking about all time, right? Yeah, this is all time. All time. All all time. time. I got to go him. Um, you know, I'm a huge Jay-Z fan. Yep. Uh, just, you know, his style, his his charisma, his, ball, you know, the, the lyrics, his ability to talk about things just in different ways. And then you talk about what he's become as a mogul, uh, different areas of his life, uh, just an incredible. And I don't know that I'm allowed to say this, this person anymore just because of how it's become. But I was a, I was a big Kanye fan. I think he's, his music he's, is still genius. He's a genius, right? I think he's a, an unbelievable creative, uh, you know, just somebody I've always been impressed with. I think what, what something I love about musicians is their ability to elicit feelings, listen, you know, create feelings for other people. And he's somebody just I, I can think back to very mem vivid memories in my life, happy, sad, elated, joy, whatever it is. And there's a Kanye song that kind of will, will play in the background to it. Uh, and then my last one, your message to Vikings fans about this 2023 team and what you guys hope to do moving forward. Yeah, you know, I think it's 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 a team that it's un, a little bit of unknowns, right? You, you've moved on for some of the players that you've come to know and love, and we've got to take a chance together to really appreciate and embrace these young players but you know they've been on this team they're they're learning this culture we're really excited about what we are we're young we're younger uh but we're you know we're fast we're hungry uh we've got we've got two great coaches on both sides of the ball kevin obviously west phillips is the offensive coordinator brian flores who Close we have man. we haven't talked about but he's 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 a special cat and so i think people are going to love what they see um and we're, we're building towards something great I, I just just know that they know that our goal is to win at the highest level. And that's how I'm going to measure myself over these, these years that they give me a chance. And, uh, you know, that's what we're trying to aspire to. And every move that we make is with that in mind. We didn't even mention Justin Jefferson's name. We didn't mention uh, Hawkinson's name. Like, there's so yeah. many guys we can go through here. But real quick, the first-round pick, Addison, who we haven't seen in an NFL field yet. You scouted him, obviously. I love I love him coming out. Like, we're going to draft you. We're going to get paid. And you're like, GM. You're like, well, <laughs> we're going we're gonna to pay you what you're paid. But, yes, yeah, maybe in second yeah. contract. Um, yeah. What do we get out of Jordan Addison so far since he's been around, just in rookie camp and whatever else? And it's so funny that that was the interaction people saw. <laughs> he, is, he is so quiet. Uh, works his butt off, uh, super cerebral, studies his plays. Every, I loved it because I feel like it was a natural thing to say. He didn't mean like financially we're going to get no, paid. It's just like a thing no. you say. Yeah, I, I say to everybody, if, if they've just achieved their childhood dream, what comes out of their mouth might not be what they think comes out of their mouth. And so, but no, he's incredible. You talk about an elite separator off the line of scrimmage. He just, he just understands body feel leverage, how to separate, uh, get open from guys, really good hands. Uh, good after the catch. Uh, we're really excited to have him, and we're going to make teams think about what they want to do with, to us on the offensive side of the football with that alien, Justin at Jefferson, oh and, my then gosh. and then TJ and then Jordan and then KJ and then the run game. We're going to get going. It's just, we got We got a lot of options that we can, we can stress defenses and we're really excited about what we're going to be 
be doing on that side of the ball. You got things to do. I appreciate you so much for taking the time. And, and in another interview, we'll talk about the backdoor pass and what it means to Princeton basketball and oh, why you have man. to execute it and why Pete Carmody was just as good as Pete Curl. No, okay. We'll, we'll, we'll <laughs> Pete Carmody or Bill Carmody? What was his Bill name? Carmody, Bill, Bill Carmody. Bill Carmody. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. I, I loved Princeton basketball. And, Quasi, I loved our time together. Dude, thank you so much for taking all this time, especially when there's mandatory mini camps and you're not sitting on the beach. We really appreciate it. Trey, it's always a pleasure, man.